mic? Yes. Yeah. All right, good, good, good. Well, let me just a lot of times I like to tap and say, is this thing on? <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Coffee and Conversation, which has a very special guest, as you can kind of see, uh, Tim, to give us an update uh, from the VA, and we'll try and do this again more frequently, mm -hmm. quarterly. Uh, for that. I'd just like to highlight our next couple of coffee and conversation speakers. Uh, well, I have handouts which has our schedule for this in the back. And you can go to our website, www.brimfieldveterans.org, listed on here. And from our website, you can connect into our YouTube channel. And that way you can see our listing of all our past coffee and conversation talks in case you'd like to catch one of them. Uh, we also <clears throat> and have finally learned how to effectively live stream. So even if you can't come in on a Saturday, uh, you can go to the link shown on our sheet here and actually see our talks uh, live on the internet. Uh, but our next talk, the 26th, that's next week, is Bob Grow. And Bob served 22 years in the Air Force, uh, was an F-4 Phantom navigator and bombardier, served in both Vietnam and the groups, he, they were called the Tiger Facts, which were the fast Ford area controllers uh, for our various bombing missions, both Laos and uh, certainly South Vietnam and North Vietnam also served in several different assignments in Europe. So that'll be a, a, very interesting. And then on 9 April, Bob McDonald uh, uh, is going to be our speaker. And Bob had joined the Army in 1959 and retired 30 years later as a colonel. And he served in the infantry, special forces, Green Berets, and military police. Uh, and during the Vietnam War, he was an advisor within the South Vietnamese Army. And let's see, on a second tour, he was designated to serve as U.S. Representative for the repatriation of enemy prisoners after the war. So that, that's a totally new and interesting area for all of us. So again, if you'd like to get copies of our schedule, it's also on our website, and we have some hard copies in the back. So thank you very much. Uh, just before we get going, check your phone, put it on mute. Invariably, they go off midway through the talks. <laughs> so, thank you. Tim? Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. So, um, I work for the Broomfield County, so I do not work for the VA. Um, I'm more of a liaison between veterans and the VA. So, um, the... Each county usually has a veteran service officer. They are um, funded partially by the Colorado Department or uh, Division of Veterans Affairs, Division of Military and Veterans Affairs, um, so that they can do outreach like this and reach veterans and, and to kind of help them with the process of filing claims or getting into health care, a lot of that stuff. So today we're going to do a presentation on overview of benefits. Some of the slides are going to be pretty pretty wordy in there, so don't, don't worry too much about it. It's to keep me on track. Um, but we're going to do a presentation on that. I, w I was in the United States Navy from 1984 to 88. I was on the USS Midway in Yokosuka, Japan. Um, I was an aviation machinist mate, which is a jet engine mechanic. And like I was telling John earlier, it took a planes, it took a college education to break, but a high school education to fix. So go figure. So... With that, we'll get right into it. Tim, one quick question. Yes. Do you only do vets that live in your county? You don't do... Well, we try to do just the veterans in the county because Adams County has one, Jefferson County has one, Boulder County has a couple. Actually, Jefferson County has a couple. So each county has them because, the, you know, the, the, the money, if we're able to get you benefits, that money goes, you know, into that county. You're spending that money in that county and... So the counties like to keep people within the county. That being said, you know, if it's closer to come to me, if someone has, you know, problems with, uh, um, say, transportation or I'm closer because, you know, they can't, they don't feel they want to drive that far, 
I, we can make everybody makes exceptions to see. We, we'd rather have you come in and and see you, but I, I always try to refer them to the county that they live in first. But yes, we will. You know, I don't think it's very good. Like Arapahoe County, if they came to see me, I'd be like, well, that's a drive. So, um, but yes, we will see people from other counties. So, how can we help? So, if you sign a form twenty one twenty two for the Colorado um, vision uh, or, or it's the Colorado Division of Veterans Affairs is my accreditation, right? So I work in, we cl work in close conjunction with the state. So a 2122 VA form allows me to access your, your file, look through your file, um, you know, kind of see if there's anything that, uh, that, like a lot of times in the past, someone was denied something, and they want to see if they could reopen it. Well, first things first. We have to look and see why you were denied, right? So I need access to that file. And also, um, a lot of times, people will forget that they filed for something, right? And they're like, no, I never filed for that. It might have been years ago they were denied. Well, if we go ahead and we put it on a, a 526EZ, which is the form for a new claim, and the VA says, well, you were denied, so you're on the wrong form. So we like to check ahead of time if we can to make sure it's not a previously denied claim. And we can assist you in, in filing the claim or development. A lot of times, you know, we're there to help you gather the evidence you need. We assist you, um, you know, in that process. And we help with the paperwork and all that. But we try to give you the best information possible to be successful with your claim. And all county veteran service officers do that. You know, gathering evidence, right? So sometimes uh, uh, someone might need a doctor's opinion because the VA gave them a negative one. I will uh, write a letter and request that from the doctor, right? See if they will be willing to do it, your, your, your doctor, because that doctor knows you. Doctors don't like to write that stuff. Why? Oh, um, oh the first thing they think is liability. But the evidentiary requirement for VA claims is 50-50 likelihood that it's related to service or at least as likely as not. We don't look for medical certainty. We're just looking for the, the, the VA evident criteria, which is at least as likely as not. When the VA goes out and looks for opinions for a, a C&P exam, if you file a claim, which stands for compensation and pension exam, they're going to contract a doctor out. You're going to go. One of the things... Um, to that point, one of the things that doctor is going to get asked to do is, is it at least as likely as not related to service, 50-50. That's the whole thing, which if a doctor understands that, they're more likely to, to um, write an opinion or a nexus letter or fill out what we call a disability benefit questionnaire. Um, we can help with service record requests. Really, the only way to get those is through archives.gov or a standard form SF-180 sent to the archives. As you, some of you may know, there was a fire there and there's some records that are unavailable. In that case, they send you another form to fill out to try and piece together those files. But when you're talking to a veteran, you're saying, hey, so you were in 60 years ago. Do you remember going to the doc? Do you remember going to the, you know, to, to medical back then? Who's going to remember, right? So it's tough to, to do that. But sometimes uh, they do remember, yeah, I did go. I don't know when it was. And they use that information. They try to use other sources to piece together some of those records. Um, and to get a copy of your DD-214, same place, archives, archives.gov. They don't give you um, an original. They give you a copy, but it has the emboss on it from the archives, which is as good as an original. So if you ever have one of those, do not give that away as a copy because that emboss is, is important to show that it, it came from the archive. So we're going to explain the life cycle of a claim, disability, or what a service-connected disability is, non-service-connected pension, which is a needs-based benefit, survivor's benefits, burial benefits. So there's three divisions in the VA, the VBA, um, the VBA, VBA um, all non-medical benefits, compensation, pension, education, home loans, voc rehab, which they changed the name of that to uh, 
veteran readiness and employment instead of vocational rehab and whatever it used to be. But So I need to update that. Don't gig me on that. <laughs> um, and it's administered at the VA regional offices. The VA regional office here in Denver is in Lakewood. It is at 155 Van Gordon Street. If you ever need a copy of a DD-214, rather than going through the archives, that would be my first stop to see if they might have it at the VA and, and be able to print a copy off for you. Um, that would be my first stop, and then if they don't have it on file for whatever reason, because you never filed or, or did anything with the VA, and they never got your file from the archives, that means they may not have your DD-214, but that's gonna be the quickest way um, to try to get one, or your home of record at the time of discharge. So you got out of the service, you went back to wherever. Sometimes that state division of Veterans Affairs may have a copy on file. So that's the second place I would check before going to the archives because the archives takes a while, especially with the COVID thing. They're backed up big time. So, uh, and then Veterans Health Administration. So, you know, all VA healthcare services. So those of you that are in the VA healthcare system, you know, they have an, uh, an outpatient clinic in Golden and then the Rocky Mountain Regional um, out there in Aurora. Um, but they also have up north, that's part of the Cheyenne healthcare system. Um, so Loveland, those areas, they, they go to the Cheyenne healthcare system, which is a, a different healthcare system, but it's still part of the VA. Um, so the VA, the Vet Veterans Health Administration, that's where you're gonna, you know, get all your health care through. Now, a lot of times people think they go to the to the veterans health care and, and they find out that maybe they have something that's connected to service and that they're automatically gonna you know file a claim for them. No. The VHA and the VBA don't really share information unless you file that claim with the VBA, then they'll go to the VHA and look for, you know look for those records. So if you ever have something that they say you should file for or, or, you know, that they might not even say that you should file for it, but if you think you should, then you have to file a claim for it. They're not going to do that for you there. A lot of people think it's automatic, and, but it is not. They don't, the, the Benefits Administration does not peek at those and then file claims. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the, the Cemetery Administration. So national and state cemeteries, support to the state cemeteries, headstones and markers, and then the presidential memorial certificates are all issued through the National Cemetery Administration. Can I ask a question? Yes. So um, I have a grave at Fort Logan, mm -hmm. but if Fort Logan filled up, mm -hmm. um, what state cemetery does it? So, they built a new one out in Grand Junction. They have one, I believe, in um, in the Springs area. And I'll, I'll have to look it up. Um, the, the Colorado Division of Veterans Affairs has a website with a lot of that information because they're the ones that administer the state cemeteries. Um, so... Well, uh, Logan's a federal cemetery. Yeah, it's a national. So that's a... The, Fort Logan is the is the national cemetery, right? But a lot of people think that you can, you know, we want to we want to reserve a spot there. They don't reserve spots. What they do is they will verify that you're eligible to be buried there. So the so if you send it in and if if you were honorably discharged, you're eligible. So, but a lot of people like to file that paperwork and they'll say, yeah, you're eligible for burial, but they don't reserve plots for for anybody. So. How full is Logan? You know? I, mean, I do I do not know. That's, and I know they also have the columbariums for, for ashes, um, and I think you need at least a third of the ashes to be in that columbarium, and the family can spread the other two-thirds or whatever. So they, they have room, um, and I know they opened up another portion of it, I'm pretty sure, so I think they got some room, but, you know, it, it, it's... So it's first come, first serve. I mean, when you're dead, mm -hmm. you either get in or you <laughs> I went one time and see if I could get, get a, get a, get a mm -hmm. and the lady goes, well, you got to die first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Well, like she said, people are dying to get in, but yeah. but yeah, that, you know, that is true. They don't, they won't reserve them. You, you know, when you pass away, you file that paperwork and then they will schedule the burial. 
is what they do. And they provide the opening and closing of the grave, the, the marker, you know. Um, the spouse can also be buried, but they, I believe that her name goes on the back of the headstone. And then one of the things I found interesting is there is really no limit. So if you, if you were married seven times, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have them all on top of each other. I don't know, I don't know how that's going to go over. But, but really, I mean, someone asked that question to the VA because the guy had, uh, you know, like a couple, couple ex-wives, and there was nothing in the room. I'm sure they're looking into that to change it, but, of course, that'll take 10 years to change it. Yes? No, if the if the wife um, predeceases, she could be buried there. But uh, the, you know, the, her name's going to go on the back of the of the marker. They will just leave the um, they'll they'll fill out the front of the marker and just leave the um, the date of death for the veteran blank. Oh, and then if so, in that case, then so I could, I could bury my ex wife first, so I get a spot. <laughs> <laughs> now now you're thinking. Now you're thinking. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Like no. Or would I want to spend eternity that close? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You have to think that through. But you know what? That's the smart. I never thought of that. That's a, that's a way to get a plot there. So. <laughs> yeah. You'd have to keep them separate. Separated. Yeah, exactly. Yes. At the Broomfield Cemetery, there's a veterans section. Yes. Are those actual grave sites or memorial headstones? Um, I believe those are grave sites because the VA will provide a headstone if you're buried in a private cemetery. Okay? But the, the, the headstone has to be placed at, at the family's expense. They won't pay for that. Whereas at the, at the National Cemetery, you know, they'll pay for the placement of the headstone, the opening, closing of the grave, um, you know, that stuff. Um, but they're still cost incurred, and they do have, and we'll talk about some burial benefits a little bit later. Yeah, what happens if you get approved for Fort Logan, mm -hmm. but by the time you're ready, there's no space available? Yeah, so when they approve you, they're just saying you're eligible for burial in a national cemetery. So they're not really saying that, you know, that they're going to have space for you. So, mm. there could be any national cemetery. So yes. If you're right. in Logan, you can go yes. Around. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, it, it's not, it's not uh, restricted to your, the state that you passed in or anything, but um, it is, I think, for the state cemeteries, there's certain criteria you have to meet to be in the state cemeteries. The, and they're, they're veteran state cemeteries. They're, they're administered. Yes? And is the family responsible for um, getting the veteran moved to that cemetery, or do they also cover the costs? It, it all depends, right? Because... You can, there's, and we'll go over this because there's certain criteria to file for a reimbursement. And, and you'll see it's pretty, you know, because a lot of people think that honorably discharged veteran, right? If you're just an honorably discharged veteran, you can file for a reimbursement, but it's not the case. There's a lot of criteria that has to be met. And we'll, I'll, have, I'll show you what the criteria is and we'll, we'll talk about that. But you, um, it depends. So, all right. So the VA claim process, you know, we receive, they receive and review an application. They have to have they, what the, what's called a duty to assist. If you haven't provided them everything they need to adjudicate the claim, they have to send you a letter and say, look, this is what we need. They have to tell you. They have to give you that duty to assist letter, and they have to request that, and they have to keep the claim open, give you time. Usually they want a response within 30 days. So, and from the date of the letter. And the date of the letter, sometimes people don't get it for two weeks after, you know. So, so um, but the duty to assist, they have to notify you of what they need for your claim to be, um, yeah, adjudicated properly. Yeah. <clears throat> so the VA will schedule an examination if necessary. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> They're called C&P exams, like, like I said earlier, compensation and pension exams. They contract those out um, to, a, to a third party. It's through LHI or VES, uh, you know, Veterans Evaluation Services. And so there's several of them. They'll call you, schedule an appointment, and they use doctors all over the place. So it may not be close by. <laughs> Could be in Aurora. 
Um, people who had to go to Cheyenne, don't ask me why, but a lot of times if they call you and they tell you, you know, your appointment's in Cheyenne, you know, you could let them know, hey, that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. I need something closer, you know. Sometimes they'll reschedule or sometimes they'll say that, you know, they couldn't schedule and then the claim gets denied because, because of all that and then you got to reopen it. But sometimes they'll work with you and, and try to schedule it closer. I don't know why they would, you know, schedule someone who filed a claim in Broomfield to go to Cheyenne for a hearing test or something, right? But they do. And then, you know, gather evidence. So the VA will go to the archives to get all your service records that are in there. They'll look through all that stuff um, because they want to make sure you meet before they're going to get a C&P exam. They want to make sure that this is going to be related to service. Did you have complaints of this condition in service? Did you, you're filing for an ankle condition. Did you break your ankle, sprain it? Did you have ankle issues? They're going to look through all the evidence in the file. If you, if you go to the VA for health care and you, you put that on the, they ask for that on the application. If you put the dates, rough dates that you know started in the system, they'll pull all those VA health care records and go through those as well. So they, they do gather evidence um, that they have to gather in order to, you know, to successfully um, review the claim. Well, can I ask you a question? If you, if you went from a private care doctor to the VA for mm -hmm. health care, mm -hmm. does the VA then grab all your old medical records so eventually they have everything in, within their system so down the road if you need to file stuff, you got all the Some, Sometimes people will... Will um, tell their doctor, or, you know, take them records and they'll scan it in the system. But sometimes they they won't see it because it's in a certain place. So whenever what I say is, if you have private medical records, you get them. You yeah, you supply them at the time of the claim if they're going to help you with that claim, right? So you take those records and you know here these these are private, and the rest you can get from the VA, or you could fill out a form that allows the VA to go and try to get those files. The VA will send you a letter back and say, we received this form, and we're going to go after the records. And then they're going to say, however, it's your responsibility to make sure we get these records. So I tell people, just go get the records if you can. Because another thing, if it costs money to get those records, VA is not going to pay it. And sometimes they use a third party to store those records, and it costs, you know, it's not a big fee usually, but VA is not going to pay it. So I would say gather your records before the claim, yes. Yeah. Help as Absolutely. So, so doctor's records, scan them mm -hmm. for yourself. Yep. And pictures. Yeah, any pictures, any pictures, pictures you have. That yeah. Been in that area or whatever. Sure. There's there's times where, especially if people have have um, pictures. Well, here's here's a great great one. We had a veteran that was um, in Vietnam, but it wasn't in his records anywhere because he was part of a squadron. We sent in a picture of him in Vietnam. Right next to the sign that said the name. <laughs> they didn't accept it. They didn't? No, we had to fight them on it. But it was ridiculous to me that, you know, that, you know, he, he wrote, the, you know, this is me, you know, and he sent another one. They said that the veteran, you know, the, with his job, he wasn't exposed to hazardous noise. Well, he sent a picture of himself and flying in a helicopter, you know. I used to, you know, he used to fly everywhere in there. Of course, it's not your job description. So a lot of times they'll look at what you did. And it, they have a list, and they're going to say, okay, you were exposed to hazardous noise or your job had a low probability of it. That doesn't tell the whole story, right? You're around hazardous noise, you know, a, a lot, you know, in the service. Um, and, you know, you just have to make a statement and let them know, hey, these are the things. And when you go to have the exam, too, tell the doctor. These are the things I was, you know, the type of noise I was exposed to when I was in. You know, so you have to make sure that, that you know, you're, a lot of times... I'll talk to someone on the phone, and they'll say, okay, so here's the situation, and they'll, they'll tell me the story. And I'll say, great. Now write it down just like you told me. Just like you told me. Tell your story to the VA just like you told it to me. And, and, and it helps tremendously because if it has to go to appeal, number one, you are capable of lay observation for any condition that affects you. My elbow hurts. Uh, I, don't, I could tell you my elbow hurts. I don't have to get a doctor to tell me my elbow hurts. 
I'm capable of conveying that to the VA. And I'm also capable of giving, being a, a, a credible historian of my own service. So I can tell you the things that I did while I was in. And they have to deem your statements. Well, here's one thing the VA doesn't do. They don't, you go to a doctor to do the C&P exam. That doctor is going to look at the exam that he just did and the evidence that the VA has. He's not going to pay any attention to anything you tell him or half the time or the statement that you make. He's just going to say, based on the evidence, well, your statement is part of that evidence. And a lot of times we go to a higher level review, which is a part of an appeal process. We argue, hey, they didn't take the statements into consideration at all. And they'll say, okay, we need to get a new exam. Okay? So you work with a veteran on that. I mean, as part of your job, you mm -hmm. advocate with the vet. For yes. How to, how to be successful with your claim, you know, what you need. Um, it doesn't always work out. Yeah. You know, if the evidence isn't there, it isn't there. And I tell them, here's what you're going to need. And sometimes they get frustrated and say, that's that then, you know. But that's, you know, I'm trying to help the best I can. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's their claim. It's your claim. You know, you have to do the things that you need to do to make it successful. I can't do it for you. I can help as much as I can. I can ask a doctor for an opinion. But at the end of the day, you have to take ownership of your claim. Can I say something? Yes. Um, I had lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And the VA took really good care of me. They did the surgery. And mm -hmm. if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be alive. Today. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've come a long way. You know, they, I've heard horror stories back in the day. And they've come a long way. They really have. You know, the VA is, a lot of veterans work there. A lot of veterans are doing these claims. And they're looking at it and they're saying, you know, according to everything, the evidence isn't here. You know, I got to deny it. They don't want to. You know, they'd love to, to, to approve those claims. But they need the evidence to do it. Their hands are tied at what they can look at and what they can't. And they can't make assumptions. They, would, they took really good care of me. I mean, yeah. three biopsies. Oh, yeah. CT scans and MRs and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've got guys in the my, my, of my the cancer end. operation cost eight hundred eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. I didn't pay it Yep. Yeah. So I mean, if you're in the VA healthcare, and we'll talk about getting into the VA healthcare system later, but yeah, it's it's come a long way. They really, you know, I have no complaints. You know, I go to the VA, um, but I only go. One, I got insurance Aetna, where I, you know, through my wife. And I go, you know, to the VA once a year to stay active in the VA healthcare system. The thing that got me going was I, when I first signed up, mm -hmm. they asked me if I had Medicare. Yeah. And Medicare paid someone. Yep. Yeah. So there's a lot of ins and outs to that healthcare system. Um, when you do get in it, well, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Let's finish the, the claim stuff. So appeals. So they, the legacy appeal system is no longer, right? Now they have a new system. It consists of a higher level review. So if we think the may, that the VA made an error of fact or law, we can file a higher level review and have an uh, informal conference with a decision review officer. Decision review officers are, have been in the VA for a while. They know the system. They know the, the rules. Um, they're really pretty good, you know, most of the time. Um, I usually do an informal conference. They'll just say, okay, it's not adversarial, so they'll just ask, okay, we're, you know, where, where, where did we err in fact in, or law? And, you know, I'll let them know where I think they erred in fact or law. Then they'll look at it, and if they grant a higher level review, then they can grant the claim at that point, or they can send it back to the VA for more development, do a new exam, get a new opinion. Um, so the higher level review is a, it's a good process and it's a lot faster than the old notice of disagreement system where the decision review officers it would take you know a year maybe sometimes two years just to get through the the notice of disagreement stage now we can get in about 90 days typically we can get an answer through the higher level review if they deny it and they say no we think we got it right well then at that point you got two other options you can get additional evidence and file the supplemental claim or you could say, no, I, I, think, I think, you know, there, this is wrong and we're going to go to a BVA judge. Now, there's three types of, of Board of Veterans Affairs law judge, you know, uh, um, ways to go, three routes. 
One of them is just to have the judge review it with, with all the evidence that's already there. The other one is you're going to have a judge review it, but you're going to submit additional evidence for him for that claim. You're going to submit it and then have a judge review it. Or the third one is a hearing, right? So you set up a hearing, and what happens is it's the, it's the, um, they're doing a lot of them virtually. So what, what that means is you could do it from your home, usually. Or a lot of times if they're in Broomfield, they can come to my office and do it there. We got the camera and all that that's set up, and we, you could do it there. Or you can go down to the regional office and do it there. Um, with, you know, through virtually at there. Now, since we work, like I said earlier, with the Colorado Division of Veterans Affairs, once you get to this point of the, of the, uh, does it got a pointer on here too? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Is that the top one? Oh, look at that. <laughs> I thought I would have figured that out sooner. Um, but right here, since, since we are, work closely and we're under the credit, accreditation of the Colorado Division of Veterans Affairs, when you get to that point, they, they take over at that point. They have a person that does nothing but appeals, and they represent you in that appeal. And how that usually goes is they're going to ask you. It's not, a non-adversarial, so you're not going to get cross-examined, or the judge might ask you questions, but um, he just wants more information. But basically, that service officer is going to, um, who's, who's taken care of those appeals, he's going to ask you questions and try to get all the evidence out there. You could submit a statement. You could read a statement. You could have someone come in and, and, and uh, testify on your behalf. You know, or you could have a doctor in there, too, to, make, you know, to tell the judge, no, I believe this is at least likely is not related to service, and here's why. So that process is, it used to be, once you did that process, and if it still got denied... You had 60 days um, to find a, a lawyer if you wanted to, to continue that claim. Now, if you get denied, you can go back to the supplemental claim even within a year and submit additional evidence and, and still keep that effective date going of when, it, when you first started that claim. So it's a, I think it's a much better, um, much better appeal process than the legacy process. They're still trying to clear the backlog of the legacy appeals. So um, that just tells you how far behind. This here, if you have to go to that point, you're about two years out right now. But the other one, the old legacy was three to five years before you get, you know, so I, I filed a, I filed a, a, an appeal for someone and told them, hey, it's going to be a while. They were calling me like, Every week, hey, what's going on with my appeal? What's going on with my appeal? You need to be patient. It's going to take years, you know? You know, and I said, you know what? If you want to know what's going on with your appeal, call the VA, okay? Because there's nothing going on with it. Um, they'll notify you when the hearing is scheduled. They might, it might take them a while to even notify you that they got it, but you'll get notified. So the appeal, it's really a last resort. I mean, but if you have to go there, a lot of times with hearing loss claims, we have to go all the way to there because of the way the VA looks at the evidence for hearing loss. And basically what they do is they look at your service entry physical audiology report and your exit physical audiology report. And if they don't see what they consider a, a positive, uh, a, a permanent threshold shift within those two, a lot of times they're going to deny that claim. Can I say something? Sure. Mm -hmm. And one day I was complaining about my hearing, and they gave me a hearing test, mm -hmm. and they gave me hearing aids. And yeah. it seems like once you get into the system, yes. it, it's easier to progress. You have, yeah, you have to be in the healthcare system, and once you get a certain percentage, they'll take care of anything yeah. without any co-pays and co-insurance, right? So um, they do a really good job with that, but sometimes people call me, and they're, they want, they, they're wondering if they can get hearing aids from the VA. And I ask them, are you in the VA healthcare system? And they say no, and I say, well, that's the first step. You have to be in there, and they, you know, and then you go from there. And they, they'll give you a referral to audiology and and go that route. But um, if you're not in the VA healthcare system, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the um, the hearing aids. I, if 
found out that if, you, if you're in and you go to your primary doctor and you complain about something, they'll set up an appointment for you. Yeah, so, if, you know, if one of the things is, yeah, they'll do the referral. They'll do that. But one of the things, too, is if you... Uh, if you're having, you know, especially if you're having trouble hearing your doctor, right? You tell your doctor, I'm, you know, I can't hear, you know, I need, you know, I need to go to audiology because, and hopefully they'll give you hearing aids so you can communicate effectively on, you know, for your health care. So, um, but, but getting in the VA health care system is the first, first step. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Um, so, um, my dad died from melanoma. Mm -hmm. So every year I get skin check, mm -hmm. but it takes a year to get to the point. Yeah, for specialists, it, you know, there are still some glitches with the VA healthcare system where when they do referrals, it could take a while, you know. But there's also, if they can't see you within a certain period of time, they're supposed to refer you out to community care. And that means a local doctor, they have to give you an authorization and approve it, and they'll open up a period of time. It's the same thing like when you're getting... Eyeglasses, they're going to refer you out. I, uh, I've had a, I had a glaucoma, mm -hmm. and I had a private doctor, and if I want to go see that doctor, the VA will give me a voucher. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's different ways, you know, um, to get to use that, but you've you got to let your doctor know if, you're, if they don't see you within 30 days, and I think they even made that a smaller period, or if you have to travel X amount of miles to get to a VA facility. They can go ahead and they can do, you know, set you up for community care. Can you have VA health care and still keep other health care insurance? Yes, be yes, because VA isn't health care, it's a, it's a health care system, it's not insurance. So you can have private insurance, you can have, you know, Medicare, but yes, you can have private, I have private and VA. Yeah. So along the same line, what is the relationship between Tricare and the VA? Um, you can, if you have Tricare, you can still get in the VA healthcare system if you would like. You know, what I tell people is, all you have to do to stay active in the VA healthcare system is to go once a year for a physical, and at the absolute minimum, once every two years if they don't, if they're not the ones giving you your medication. So circumstances change. So for example. Something happens and you need some in-home care. Tricare, I don't know if they're going to foot the bill for that. And I know Medicare will only for probably a certain period of time maybe. But the VA, if you're in the VA healthcare system, you talk to your social, when you have a PAC team, when you're in the VA healthcare system, you get what they call a PAC team, patient line care team. That team consists of doctors, nurses, and a social worker. Um, you, you reach out to that social worker and you say, you know, uh, you go to the doctor, obviously the doctor appointment, uh, but the doctor and the social worker can set up different types of care, different options. So, um, service connect disability. So, service connect disability is something that is considered service connected, um, a disability resulting from disease or injury incurred or aggravated while on active duty. It does not have to be combat or wartime related. I was playing basketball, I tore my knee while you were in. If there's evidence of that, uh, you know, in your service record, that's, that's a claim. You know, you can file a claim for that. But you have to have three things for any disability claim. An event or injury in service. You have to have a diagnosed disability right now. And um, you have to have a medical nexus or a connection between those things. Okay? So you tore your knee ligament when you were in, when you got out. You know, you kept having issues with the knee, you had knee surgery, you, you go back and get all those records, you file a claim um, for, knee, for uh, you know, a knee because they're going to look back in the records and say, yeah, he, he hurt his knee when they're in. They're going to give a CMP exam and then they're going to ask that doctor that does that compensation and pension exam based on all this evidence, is it at least as likely as not related to service, right? Um, when it comes to hearing loss, a lot of times, you know, hearing goes with age, right? There's age-related hearing loss. So if someone was in 60 years ago and they have hearing loss now, the VA is going to know that, hey, well, there's a certain amount of age-related hearing loss. 
they're going to ask you questions. When did you know? When did your hearing loss begin? Um, you know, tinnitus. When did you first hear the ringing in your ears? They're going to ask you those questions. If you say, "Well, a couple years ago," they're going to say, "Okay, you're in 60 years ago. Yes, you were exposed to loud noise. Your your entry and exit physical show no threshold shifts, and you know it's 60 years later, and you know it's probably less likely than not as, that it's related to your service." That being said, there's studies out there that show if you have hazardous noise levels at a certain time period when you're, when you're younger, that it can exacerbate that proboscis or, or age-related hearing loss. So that is something that VA doesn't really subscribe to, but there's studies that show that, and you could show that to a doctor and maybe get the doctor to write a statement saying, hey, based on the evidence, yeah, it's at least as likely as not, and here's why. It's not enough for the doctor to say it's at least as likely as not related to service. They have to give a rationale as to why. If they don't, the VA is going to automatically give more weight to the other examination because they had a rationale. Sometimes they're going to give more weight because they had a better rationale, right? So if I have a knee condition, I'm trying to get service connected and I need a nexus letter, I'm not going to go to my family doctor. I'm going to go to an orthopedic and see if, you know, my orthopedic doctor, whoever's taking care of that, and see if he'll write me a, a letter, right? So um, I always say the more, more uh, initials after the name of the doctor, the more uh, abbreviations there, the better, right? So the more specialized, the better. Hey, Tim. Yes, sir. Um, on that one that you showed, you showed his hearing loss, just, just for general information, um, the first time I ever went after that, um, I was, uh, had a hearing test over a number of times, but the hearing test here, uh, where we live, commercially done, mm -hmm. um, and then they said, you're going to go to the VA, aren't you, to get hearing aids? I said, yes, I am. Ask for this. And I took that information with me to the VA. Mm -hmm. They said, we can't use your hearing test that you had in a private, with a private facility, mm -hmm. we're going to do our own, yep. but we're also going to take into account that this particular hearing aid equipment was recommended. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I got that, yep. which was like head and shoulders above anything that they would standard give out. Yeah, and there's two, two conditions that you file for. So when you provide a hearing test, you're showing the VA that you have a current diagnosed disability. That's the first step. So you're showing them, yes, I have hearing loss, but there's two conditions that... Um, that the VA will still do their own exam. Hearing loss and PTSD or mental health conditions, um, they will do their own exam on those. If you have a, a neck condition, cervical spine condition, you can go to your, um, your doctor and he can write a nexus letter and, and fill out a disability benefit questionnaire and you can submit those. If you already have a service-connected disability, and say, say you have, um, you're a Vietnam veteran, you have diabetes, it's presumptive for Agent Orange, you're service-connected for diabetes, and you start getting you know, neuropathy, or you started on insulin, um, so you, you want to file for an increase, you could take that if you have a private doctor, they can, you could take that and he'll fill out the disability benefit questionnaire because you're already service-connected for it and it will show them what the current state is of that condition, and they'll use that without even scheduling an exam most of the time and just say, okay, here's the, here is the, um, the rating based on the information we have. So, yeah? So, you're saying, um, I have a 10% for tinnitus, mm -hmm. and I went back to the VA because my hearing's getting worse and that pitch is getting higher, mm -hmm. and when I got my audio test they said she said oh no you're fine so would you suggest maybe i go outside and do an audio well, hear from somewhere else because i i, I know it's not right so so not yeah but tinnitus is 10 percent is the maximum you'll get for that it's the minimum it's the maximum that's the only rating for tinnitus right, right. For increase, so right and so for hearing loss you have to have a certain amount of hearing loss before the va considers it as um, a disability, okay? So if you meet that criteria, they'll consider it a disability, but if you don't meet that criteria, they're going to come back and say, no, you, for, for VA purposes, 
you don't have hearing loss. Now, that being said, they, what, how they figure it out is they average between four frequencies and they're not testing that. They're not including those higher frequencies, which a lot of times show are, are indicative of a noise notch, which shows um, noise-induced hearing loss. They don't, they don't use that 8,000 range for the, for the average. So you just have to monitor your, um, you know, if you ever have a question about it, you can take your hearing test to, to a service officer, and they should be able to look at that and then use the, the schedule, the, <laughs> the thing that they use for, for, you know, for the graph and, the, and all that that they use for hearing loss and what percentage it's at. So 0% for hearing loss isn't a denial, it's service connected, it's just non-compensable. So if it came back, sometimes people say, I was denied hearing loss, I said, no, it's 0%, that's favorable, that's a win. Because as your hearing gets worse, then you can file for those increases. 0% is service connected. A lot of people have different stuff, scars, if you have a service connected disability and they might rate a scar and if it's not painful, they'll give you 0% for that scar, but they'll also give 0% for hearing loss. Um, they would, they used to give 0% for like knee conditions and stuff, but if you have pain with motion, they have to give you the minimum compensable rating, which is 10% with pain with motion because a ruling came down and pain in itself is considered a disability. So a lot of veterans filed claims and they had pain, but they had full range of motion and they denied the claim and they denied the claim because they didn't consider pain a disability. Well, that's changed. Pain is considered disability. It's a, it's a, and it's a 10% rating, pain with motion. Every time I go to the VA, mm -hmm. they ask me, what's your pain level? Mm -hmm. It goes from 1 to 10. Yeah. But that's, but that's different. That's health care. That's not benefits. So benefits is always different than health care. You can't confuse those two. I never claimed any benefits for hearing or anything, mm -hmm. but they still took care of you. Well, if, yeah, they'll take care of you on a lot of that stuff because if you're um, if you're at a certain percent or you're in the VA health care system, they'll refer you through the system and do all that. But it, when it comes to service-connected disability, um, it's a whole different ballgame. Disability terms. So acute disability, chronic disability. Acute, short duration, clears without residuals, common cold, flu, uh, sometimes a sprained ankle. You sprained it, okay? So people want to file a claim, I sprained my ankle in service or... You know, I had this and, uh, you know, ingrown toenails, different things. You could file for it, but you have to have a disability now. You know, you could have bra broke your jaw. And if there's no, di in, you know, if there's no disability right now, they, they'll, you know, they can either deny it and say you don't have a disability or they can say, okay, we'll give you 0% because, you, you know, you broke it in service. So it's non-compensable, but service connected then, which is good because later on, if you start having issues and pain, you know, then you, tell, then you can go back and say, hey, I'd like an increase because I'm starting to have, you know, um, issues with the, with the pain in my jaw and stuff. So, um, and then chronic disabilities, long-term, hypertension, arthritis, migraines, you hurt your knee, and over time, you know, you got arthritis. Um, you know, those are all things that are considered chronic, and that's what the VA is looking for. Sometimes in, in people will bring me, some records, and if it's not a stack like this, because I get them, but if it's a smaller stack, I, I got to go through every one because I don't want to. I don't want to submit anything that's going to be detrimental to the veteran, right? So, so um, you know, or or if there's no disability there, I'll let them know. We can file for it, but you don't have a diagnosed disability. There's nothing here that says that. But um, arthritis, migraine headaches, hypertension, something that's long term and chronic. That meets the criteria of a, of a disability as far as the VA is concerned. And then in the light of duty. One of the things I get questioned sometimes, reservists and, and National Guard. So a National Guard person can do 20 years in the National Guard and never be called to active duty except for training. And they want to file a claim. Well, if you don't if you, the VA looks at active duty other than, other than training. So if you're in the reserves or the National Guard and you got called up, Title 10 orders, you got a DD-214 for that, they will look at any medical records during that period. They're not going to look through your whole 
reserve or National Guard career. If you've never been called to active duty, you can't really file a claim because you fall under the, the governor, not the president, and it's not federal, it's state, right? So National Guard people have a, a difficult time unless you have a line of duty determination. If you get hurt and you got an LOD and that's in your records, the VA will look at that and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to consider this period where you got hurt and got treated as active duty. But they have to have that LOD. If you don't have it in your records, an LOD, um, even if you have, uh, you were seen for something in there, but there's no LOD, you'll have a tough time service connecting it. And a lot of times, even getting your records from the National Guard, because they usually stay with the unit, and then they have a depository where we put them, but it's not the same as, as um, the archives, the federal, right? So sometimes it can be tough to get those, those um, National Guard records. But the, the line of duty is the key for, for someone in the National Guard. Disability compensation, it's tax-free. You don't have to claim taxes on any of that. That is tax-free benefit. For how long? Yeah, I don't know. A service-connected disability, disability resulting from injuries, illness, or disease, aggravated, um, incurred or aggravated on act duty. So you have to be discharged under other than dishonorable conditions. Dishonorable discharge, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to get benefits. If you have two periods uh, where you re-enlisted and you still have a good DD-214, you want to, and you got hurt or you're claiming the period during that good period of active duty service, then you can, you know, you might have had your dishonorable discharge later after that first period, but you have a DD-214. They will consider that as a good, all the way up until, you know, that second that second one, if it's a dishonorable um, or, or, yeah, dishonorable, they won't consider any of that for VA. But if you have two of them, you served a couple, you know, a couple times or, or you re-enlisted and you have a good DD-214, you can still file because you do have an honorable discharge on that first uh, discharge. Um, and compensation is paid for disability from 10 to 100%. So it's always in whole numbers. It's never... A, there'll never be a five. Um, once you hit five, they round it up. If you're below five, they round down. So it'll always be between 10 and 100 and, and whole, um, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, like that. VA math is a whole nother ball game. When you're adding up your percentages, we would have to probably have a whole presentation just on VA math. But I always like to use this as an example because a lot of people think, well, I have, I have, uh, a nine, I had 90%, I got a 10% rating, I should be at 100. No. What they do is they look at what's left as the body as whole. So if you're at 90%, 10% is whole. You get another 10% rating, it's 10% of 10, which is 1. Goes to 91, rounds down to 90. You need another 50% on top of 90 to get to 100. So I, call, I like to call it VA math. I don't know. Um, veterans may be eligible for additional compensation if they are very seriously disabled, have qualified dependents, or, or have a seriously disabled spouse. Um, there's different benefits. Aid and attendance is one of them. You can get aid and attendance for disability and also for the non-service connected pension, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Establishing the claim directly, a direct service connection means you got hurt. You know you're gonna you're gonna file for that. It's a direct service connection. Aggravation. So they noted on your entry exam, you have a knee condition. Well, you got in and you, you hurt your knee worse. That's an aggravation because they already had it. They already had it listed that you had a knee condition, but because you hurt it again and it's all annotated in the medical file, um, you can file for aggravation to that condition. Um, the uh, the thing with that is, it has to. So if you have something, um, sometimes it's a disease or whatever that, that, um, that it may be genetic. And it gets diagnosed when you're in service. So, so the VA might say, well, this isn't as a result of service, it's genetic. And then if it doesn't, if the, if the service time that you're in, if it, doesn't be, if it isn't aggravated beyond the natural progression of that disease, 
That is what's needed for aggravation. So if you hurt your knee and over time, you know, but when you're in, so they have it notated on your entry exam, you have a knee condition, you, you do your duty, you don't have any issues. Later on, you start having knee issues and you file a claim. They're going to say, well, that's the natural progression of the disease. Some, you know, they'll look at that and they'll have a doctor make an opinion. Is this a natural progression of that knee condition or was it aggravated in service and where's the evidence of that? Um, and then presumptively. So some presumptively is like for Agent Orange, right? Gulf War, they have uh, different conditions. Camp Lejeune water, right? The contaminated water at Camp Lejeune. Um, and then they added a couple more, obviously for Agent Orange hypothyroid, hypothyroidism oof, and bladder cancer. And then the, for the Gulf War, and all continuing now, allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, and asthma are now considered presumptive for burn pits. I have I had Vietnam veterans say, well, we had burn pits. I'm like, well, do you have sinusitis or asthma or allergic rhinitis? Get me a diagnosis and we'll fall, and we'll fight them on it. What was the bladder cancer like? The bladder cancer, yeah. It's, yeah. it's now considered presumptive for Agent Orange. So if you served in Vietnam and you have bladder cancer, maybe you filed years ago and they denied it. Well, you probably got a letter saying it's under review now. Because if you previously filed and were denied, they, because it was a condition that was added later, what they're going to do is what they call a NEMA review, right? NEMA review. And NEMA is the one that fought um, the VA and won because he filed a claim for something. I think it was diabetes, and then later it became presumptive. So they had to go back to the time he originally filed because they denied him. So now they do NEMA reviews. And they, it's an automatic trigger when they do that. They go back and they look. They have one, I think it's San Francisco, that's all they do is these things. A couple, couple stations. Um, that's all they do is the NEMA reviews to see if someone was previously denied for um, bladder cancer or hypothyroidism and then go back. Man, I have trouble with that one, hypothyroidism. They go, they'll go back and pay retroactively to that original point where you were denied. Wow. So um, something to keep in mind. Presumptively, so, and then secondary, right? So, uh, diabetes, perfect example. You get kidney issues from that, um, neuropathy. All these things that are secondary to diabetes can be filed, right? And there's other conditions too. Uh, uh, I have a right knee condition. Well, because I overcompensate on the left side, my left knee went bad. Well, it, you know, you can file for the left knee as um, secondary to the right knee. So, there's a lot of different questions or different things that go into the secondary um, service-connected condition claim, but if it's related to a primary service-connected condition, you can file for it. No time limit to apply for a claim. It just gets tougher the further you are from service to show, unless you had, the, the main thing is showing from since the time of service, a continuity of symptoms or a continuity of treatment. Those are those are main things. So you got out, you had, you know, your back was hurt, and you, you you kept going to a chiropractor, chiropractor, it got worse. You went ahead and filed a claim. If you can gather those notes, doctor's notes, and I know it's tough to go back for a long time, but you can also make a statement, like we talked about earlier, and say that you know when you got out, you were seeing chiropractors, um, you know, or you went to a doctor and 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 were seen for this back condition. Um, there's a lot of stuff that those statements can really uh, fill in the holes with. So, um, and then uh, post-discharge. So if you file, if you're recently retired, separated from the military, you got a year to file that uh, initial claim. Within that year time frame, if you file for all, uh, whatever conditions, they're gonna, they're gonna consider those as presumptive to related to service a lot of times because you're within a year of that service, right? So, so I always tell, tell anyone, if you want to file for something, do it within that year because they're going to look at it and consider it. You know, so even if it's not in the, you never, didn't make complaints of it in service, you want to try and file that within that one year. Um, that, that, uh, that one year, there's, there's some exceptions to that. One of them is sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. 
That is a tough one to get service connected unless you have a sleep study when you're in service. If you could be out of service for one day, get a sleep study, and they're going to say, where's the, where's the complaints in service? You know, what, what's going on? But you could fight it. You know, you'd have to do some, some work, but you can fight it. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but you, if you can get the evidence that you need, you could get it service connected, but you'll probably have to take it to appeal. Um, if after one year, so, so when, you, when you separate or retire, if you file it within that year, they're going to go back to the day after you were discharged retroactively. Once you pass that one year mark, you're going to have to file the claim and it's going to be the date that you file or the, the date that the VA received the paperwork for filing. So you got that one year, they'll go back to the day after you got out. After that one year, it's when you file the claim or an intent to file um, or put in an intent to file on the books. Original claims go on a 526EZ. Standard claim process. Um, that's the one where you give the VA a 21, 41, 42 and let them go and try and seek all that, that medical evidence. Or you give them medical evidence after, um, after you've been uh, already started the claim. If so you can submit more evidence, but they're going to kick you out of the fully developed claim pile into the standard claim. It takes a little longer, but fully developed claim, you give them everything they need up front. All the medical records, everything, and then have them decide the claim. And then an intent to file, you're thinking about filing a claim, you file an intent to file, it protects that date as the effective date of claim. You got 365 days to file the, the claim. Um, and then pension, non-service connected pension. This is the one I get most questions about, right? So non-service connected pension, in order to be eligible, you know, you had to serve during, during these different periods. <clears throat> It is a needs-based benefit. That means you have to meet financial criteria and your income and assets are all looked at because it's a needs-based benefit. But all, you, know, you have to fall in these periods. Since I served 84 to 88, I don't even qualify, nor does my wife if I were to pass away for this benefit. But it is one that you might have heard of aid and attendance, right? That's, um, that's this. It is mean tested, means tested. Everything is considered countable income, right? Payments, interest, dividends, payments. They look at everything. It's just like filing a claim for Medicaid. You know, Medicaid, they're going to go back. They do have a three-year look back for any asset transfers. They didn't used to, but they've instituted that. Here's the current net worth. So that means all your assets plus... Nice round number. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. And, uh, you know, when I looked at it, I'm like, well, it went up a little. $400. So, um, but that, that includes also your income for that year. So you have to factor in what your income is for that year and all that other stuff, and it has to be underneath that before you can qualify. Yeah. And so here's the maximum allowable pension rate. Is that joint benefits, wife, and, and household income. So this here, if you don't have any dependents, right, and, and a, a, a veteran with no dependents, there. If you have a veteran who needs A and A, yes. there is your maximum income. But here's the thing. Here's where this benefit comes in. You have to go to an assisted living or, or a nursing home facility all the money you pay towards that facility, which is a lot, you have to start probably digging into assets because you're up underwater on, on your income and what the cost of the facility is, then you would qualify because they will, that is considered accountable deduction, all the money you pay to that facility. So it effectively puts you underwater and you can get you know, the full amount, which helps to stretch the assets out. Um, no, your wife no, you don't have to relinquish them if you're underneath the threshold. So here's the thing. But if you, but if you have assets that are above that, yeah, you have to spend down. But, but where, where it is is if, you're a, 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 if your spouse is deceased, then that, that threshold has to be $2,000 for Medicaid. You know, it's 138 or whatever it was, 138000 How much does it benefit? Is it a VA... 
Is it a right there's is it the a living place that you have to be at? No. <coughs> no. So any any, any assisted living or nursing home, independent living doesn't qualify. They don't give you the level of care that's considered accountable deduction because the level of care isn't there. It has to be assisted living or um, yeah. nursing home. So but how, how much of that will they pay? What's that? How much of that will they pay? This is the maximum amount you could get. Okay. So if you're, if you're a veteran, you have no dependents, and you, you need aid and attendance, you're in an assisted living facility, that's what you'll get per year if you qualify for the full amount of the benefit. And all this is on the va.gov website. All you have to do is go up to the search bar and hit pension or, or what have you. But you can't make over 138000 right? Well, you can't have 138000 in assets plus income. income. Yeah. Well, your primary residence doesn't, doesn't count. It's just considered stocks, bonds, mutual funds, investments, property that you might own other than your primary residence. Um, there's a lot of, lot of things that they look at, but that $24,000, if, if you have one dependent and you have a spouse, then, whoop, then, then it goes up to this. That's the max amount. But it helps stretch out those assets a little bit. I mean, thirty grand a year almost, right? Well, yeah. twenty nine. I mean, it helps stretch those assets out. But it is a process to get approved. You may have to do a spend down of assets. But, you know, it's how long is it going to take if you're paying, uh, you know, how much is an assisted uh, living facility? You know, some, you know, some people paying 7500 a, a month. How long do you think it's going to take to spend down assets like that? So this benefit really comes in handy because a lot of people don't qualify it unless they can use that countable income deduction towards a facility. That's where this really comes into play, especially for surviving spouses. Speaking of which, surviving spouses, right, will do this. Look at the, look at the difference. That's the maximum amount there. So, so put it this way, if, you're, if you're, uh, you're living at home, but you're making 12000 a year on Social Security and you don't have any, you're not even going to qualify because that's the threshold. If you have a dependent child, it goes to there. If you have um, no dependents and you need aid to tenants, so you're going to be in a facility or someone's going to take care of you at home, but you meet all the criteria, then it goes there to 15816 And if you have one dependent, then it goes, goes to there if you have aid and attendants. It's not a huge benefit by, by any means. It's not meant to pay your whole, a lot of people are like, well, will they pay for my, my cost of my, you know, we want this, they'll pay for it. And well, no, they won't pay for everything. You're going to get some money. But when you spend down and you get to a point, if you're in a facility that, if you're in a facility that um, accepts Medicaid, then you can get it down to where your assets, when your assets are there, then you could transfer because you've been private paying, then you could transfer to Medicaid once your assets hit that $2,000 level. Or, the 138,000 if your spouse is still um, still alive, but you know how Medicaid works. They want to come after the house and stuff, uh, you know, um, to help pay for that. So it's a needs-based benefit. It's complicated. If you have any questions about it, the VA.gov is a great website. They've really redone it. Or you can call me, and if I don't answer, I'll call you back. Yes, sir. Is that influenced by inflation and cost of living? Every December. First, the VA will consider a cost of living increase. And the reason why they do it December 1st is because they pay a month behind. So December 1st through 31st benefits are payable January 1st. January 1st through January 31st payable February 1st. So in December, it starts to kick in January 1st because it actually starts in, in February, right? I mean the limits. Hmm? Yeah, those those yeah they will they will increase those according to cost of living, but it doesn't go up a lot. I mean, when I change these from last year, they went up a little. They go up a little every year, so uh, that's why. And on the website, you can go back and look at the past years. Um, but yes, every December first, they're going to take that into consideration, and if Congress approves it, then they'll increase it. DIC. Here's one that dependent indemnity compensation, if a veteran passes from a service-connected disability, this is one of them with a lot of stuff on there. Um, so if the veteran passes from a service-connected disability, the spouse can file that DIC claim, dependent indemnity compensation claim. 
If the veteran was a, a, at a hundred percent for ten years prior to his death, it's automatic. The spouse will get it no matter what the veteran passed from. Doesn't matter if it's service connected or not. Um, and then um, the, the the important thing about this is when it comes to anyone that's service connected for a certain percentage, that death certificate has to show that a service connected disability is the primary cause of death or a major contributing factor. And that has to be listed on that death certificate for the VA to consider it. If it's not listed, like uh, I came, I did a, a claim just yesterday and it has a condition on there that should be considered, but they never listed diabetes as a major contributing factor, which it was. So if she gets denied, sometimes we have to go back and try to get those things amended and they will amend them to put that on there, then we can refile at that point. So DIC is if you're, if the, the veteran who's collecting, um, now here's the thing, if the veteran never filed a claim and that veteran passed away from something that could be considered service connected, let's say um, he had a heart condition, never filed a claim, he's a Vietnam vet, passed away from the heart condition, doesn't matter how long ago he passed away, she can use that death certificate and show that he died from a heart, um, you know, if it says coronary artery disease on there, which shows ischemic heart disease, she can file that claim for dependent indemnity compensation because he passed, he w would have been eligible for that VA benefit. So it, they don't, sometimes they don't have to even be service connected and you could still file for that if they meet the criteria. Long-term care is another one. If you're private paying at Fitzsimmons, that's what you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. um, have they started considering the women, like, um, women's issues of, like, ovarian cancer or hysterectomies after coming back? Um, it's, so, so something like that, if, if, if we could show it's related to service somehow, then you could file a, you know, you could file a, a service connect disability for it, but um, is that what you're talking about for service connection? Um, it was, one, one was filed, but it was denied. Uh-huh. Um, well, the only things that are the only things that were added to the burn pits is that allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, and you know. But however, that being said, if you go get a doctor, if, if it's you can go direct service connection too, and if you could show evidence and give that to a doctor and say, look at these studies that these things are creating these types of issues, and that doctor says, yeah, it's at least as likely as not it was related to that, especially the time frame. Yeah, it is the wording. Yeah. That's what they look at, at least as likely as not, or more likely than not. I just hate when they come back and say it's less likely than not, because that means it's a denial. Yeah. So, so a long-term care, um, if you have any questions about long-term care, if you want to find out how much it's going to be of a co-payment, so if a veteran is 70% service-connected, they have priority, if you're 70% or more. If you want to know what a copayment is, you fill out this form. It's a 1010 EC. It goes to the VA. They're going to look at income. They're going to look at all that stuff, and they're going to find out what your what your copayment um, is going to be for a long term care facility. At at you know at a government run, we're talking like Fitzsimmons. They got Home Lake. They got a bunch of them in the state. Um, Veterans Living Centers, and it's all on the state website as well. So here's the one, the burial benefits, right? And burial benefits, um, you know, the, the VA, the State Cemetery Grand Junction, uh, I think that, like I said, I'm pretty sure there was one by the springs that they opened up. I can't remember where it's at, um, but it's on the, on the Department of Veterans Affairs Colorado website. Um, burial flags. A funeral director, I tell people if they're using a funeral director, let the, let the funeral director know that the veteran, uh, the, you know, the deceased was a veteran. Be, and give him a DD-214. He'll get the burial flags. He'll set up the, the military honors. They have a hotline for, I don't even have that number, can't find it. It's hard to find. It's a funeral director that has that number that goes straight to set up the, the military honor. Um, and then, of course, you can file a DIC if it's a, if it's a, um, service-connected death, and then if the death is service-connected, there's also a benefit where they pay a stipend if you have a person, a young person under the age of, I think it's 23, if they're 
um, up to age 23 if they're in college um, that can get a stipend while they're going to, while they're going to college. Um, so here's the one. This is for the burial cost reimbursement. And this thing has more oars than a Viking ship. <laughs> the veteran died as a result of a service-connected disability. Or the veteran was receiving VA pension or compensation at the time of death. Or veteran was entitled to receive VA pension or compensation at the time of death, but decided instead to have his or her full retirement pay or disability pay. Or... The veteran died while hospitalized by the VA or while receiving care under a VA contract at a non-VA facility. Or the veteran died while tra traveling under proper authorization at VA expense for treatment or care. Or he had an original or reopened claim for compensation and pension that would have been granted had he not passed away. Or she or she. Or the veteran died on or Oct October 1996 while a patient at a nursing home. That's only for reimbursement. Yeah. That's for the burial. Yep. Yeah, so that we're talking. We pay for it out of our own pocket, then we file. <laughs> Correct. Unless, unless the spouse, the surviving spouse, if the surviving spouse um, is entitled to DIC, then since it's a, considered a service-connected death, they'll automatically send a two thousand dollar payment for, for help with the burial. So that's the one, and, and it's, so it's not for every veteran, and, and I get this question a lot. You have to meet the criteria. You should put the date on those slideshows because I'm sure those, uh, everything changes oh, it all does. the time. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, well, that's why I was busy last night updating it. <laughs> um, and then the service-related death, like I said, they'll pay 2000 um, 1500 if they died before September 11, 2001. Know that there's no time limit for this. You know, you could file back if you didn't know about it or whatever, and you got those receipts, you could file back. Um, Non-service related death. So your service connected for something, but it wasn't related to service. $300 for burial and $796 for a plot. And this is all considering that you're not being buried in a national or state cemetery. This is private if you're going to a private cemetery. And then a VA hospital veteran, they'll pay $796, uh, hospitalized veteran, 796 for burial and 796 for a plot. So I had to, I always have to check because I got to update the amounts because it does change. Whew. We got through it. Um, Mike Chasm, so are you going to put them on the website or something? Okay, good. Good. Tim's entire presentation. What? I'm going to be on TV? Yeah. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Am I live now? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mom. <laughs> yeah. Got to say hi to Mom. So, uh, and, and the other thing, the VA.gov website is really good. You know, if you ever need information, you can just go to VA.gov. There's a search tool. You could put in COVID. We were going to talk about COVID a little bit, but the main thing about COVID is it changes all the time. So you want to go to the website and really find out. But, you know, a, a veteran that's in the VA healthcare system, him and the spouse are eligible, and I think dependents um, can, get, can get the vaccines through the VA. Um, and, you know, you really have to know, you know, keep up on the facility. They may require a mask. They may not. It, you know, things are kind of loosening up, but everything can change on a dime, as you know. So um, there was that. And then caregivers... Um, they've opened up the caregiver program so that, um, you know, Vietnam veterans, the spouses that are taking care of the Vietnam veterans, the caregiver program is administered through the health care, not the benefits. So you want to talk to the social worker at the VA. So the, the, the veterans social worker at the VA, the spouse wants to talk to them to get into it. And once they get into that, they go through some training but they, it opens up some stuff, including a stipend pay, paid directly to that caregiver. Um, respite, you know, there's, there's respite care in case they have stuff they got to do or go out of town. It's a great program. Um, it's in, you know, it's in its infancy. Um, so they're working out glitches. It's been around a couple years now, but it's a great program. And so that was the thing, the two that I really want to talk about was COVID. And, um, you know, just to let you know that really, it just depends because it changes so much. And the caregiver program, you have to go through that VA social worker. So, yeah. 
this is a, an unusual question, but um, my father was buried in a uh, at Arlington, and my mother uh, outlasted him by a number of years. Mm -hmm. And then when she passed away, she was going to go into that same plot, mm -hmm. but because of the volume of people going into Arlington, she had we had to wait for yep. forty five days. Yes, yeah. forty five days of cold storage at a funeral home. Yep. Does VA pay for that? I'm going to say probably not, but you know, one thing to know is there is a, um, it's, it's all states or veterans cremation, right? And, and funeral services and stuff. But if you're not sure what you're going to do, they will take the body and they'll hold it free until you figure out what's going on. I don't know how long they'll do that, but it's something for you to, to know to call all states or all veterans because they will hold that body in cold storage until... Um, I don't know how long, right? But but it would be worth a phone call to to talk to him. But I don't know if they would pay that because she is the spouse, and and, and burial benefits really don't go. You know, because if the spouse doesn't normally um, receive those burial benefits. It's the veteran that does, and the reimbursement is for the veteran Jim, as well. Do you have that contact information for all states? Um, I do not, but I will get it. And or is that something the funeral? Yeah, I mean, all states, if you, if you, if you, uh, and I, all veterans and all states are pretty much the same, but if you, if you um, search, do a quick search for all, um, all veterans cremation, um, and it'll come up, and, and you can give them a call and find out. I don't have any information on them. Um, that being said, up here, I have some hand sanitizer, some left, help yourself to it. I have pens that have my phone number on it. Uh, and I have some cards and informational postcards that have a lot of the stuff on it. And so if you know someone that needs some help, you can take a couple and give them a card or something. But um, all that's up there for you. And, um, you know, I, if you have questions, because a lot of times people, something will come up and they'll have questions, feel free to call me. I'll get back with you and I'll, I'll answer it the best I can or point you in the best direction. Do you know your counterparts for Jeffco County? Yes, Pete Mortaro and Diane, um, Dr. Diane Ricci. No, they're both really good at what they do. Been doing it. Diane, uh, Pete's been doing it for years. He was he did it in Nebraska, and Diane used to be the exec uh, 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 second in command at the Colorado Department of Veterans Affairs, oh, really? and then she went over to um, to Jeffco to be a service officer. So they're both really really good. Where are those offices located, Jeffco? In Jeffco. Um, Jeffco is right before you get to the to the um, courthouse, Taj Mahal, right? They're on Illinois at the Human Services Building, um, right there at I think it's Jefferson County Parkway. You take that and then you turn on Illinois. So it's it's right, uh, yeah, it's right before. If if you were to keep going on that road, it would take you to the sheriff's department. And then if you keep going around the sheriff's department, cross street, you're at the Seabock there. The the Golden Outpatient Clinic. So it's, they're real close to that. And he goes there. I think he's there on. They're there on every every Tuesday. One at one or other of them. They're at that Golden Clinic a lot, helping veterans. I think it's Tuesdays. I'm not sure. Jefferson County. They're out. You know, they're a lot of times they're out because they're they're a busy office and they do things. Um, you know the way they do things. For me, you know, for me when I. When I talk to someone, I, you know, Broomfield's a lot smaller, obviously, than, than Jeffco. But like I said, I do get, you know, outliers from Adams, Boulder, and, <laughs> and, and Jefferson. But um, I, I'm not sure, but if you call them, they'll, they'll, they'll set it up for you. You might talk to Mary when you call. She's the administrative, and she, she's probably going to be the one that sets the appointment. But depending on what it is, that, you know, he'll probably tell you what to bring, you know, what type of evidence or, or whatever. But yeah, and Adams County is at 118th and Pecos. That's where Adams County is. So, yes, sir. Got one question. Mm -hmm. Does it being married qualify you for that aggravated pain? <laughs> <laughs> I feel it. I feel your pain. But, uh, I mean, and my doctor says it's highly likely. More likely than not. Yeah. He, he skipped the more likely. He said it's highly, uh, he said it's almost a certainty that it's related. So, well, thank you all very much for, for showing up. And
feel free to give me a call. Just before you go, Tim, we'd yes. like to give you one of our mugs. Oh, thank you. We already have a challenge call. Yes, and I do. We have two several references upstairs on our kiosk just outside of our office store, which might be of interest to you. One is the Vets Go program by Cultivate, which basically is providing medically related transportation to senior veterans. You can call them to make arrangements. Another one, which is even, even more extensive, uh, is the Veteran and Family Resource Hub, uh, qualified listeners. And they provide a whole broad range of services and also are always looking for volunteers to help. Mm -hmm. In fact, Greg Gersh, who's kind of heads this program, was in here last week uh, at our coffee and conversation. But both of these we have uh, on the kiosk, so look for them. Uh, strongly recommend, you know, just pick one up. So again, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Tim. You bet. And we'll reschedule you back probably June or so. Let's Whenever show. the next time period would be good. Yeah, for sure. We'll. we'll